so good evening everybody and welcome to the going digital uh, discussion set of discussions we have been having today we have a very special speaker and guest shrinivas chilara he is the uh, managing partner at swan speed consulting he is an engineer from iit kharagpur and he has a post graduate information systems uh, engineering degree from uh, university of reading in berkshire So he has very wide experience in uh, software system development. He's worked in various roles, domains, countries, styles of functioning, programming languages, and platforms for over two decades. Now he's honed his uh, skills in software development and data analytics, uh, and particularly his expertise lies in the very esoteric field of forecasting and quantitative anomaly detection. So uh, welcome to the going digital discussion uh, uh, Shini and uh, thanks for joining us today. Oh thank you thank you the pleasure is all mine and uh, I have seen other uh, 10x td uh, you know uh, videos and information sessions which are you know very good so I'm very happy to join that uh, you know august company so thank you very much great no, so it doesn't seem so esoteric to me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah let's try and let's try and demystify it as we go along so okay. uh, f- my first question to you is uh, swan speed right i mean what does swan speed stand for and what does it do as a company well uh, swan speed uh, basically it stands for the idea that a lot of things can be achieved without uh, you know running around like headless chickens so you can do things with speed and with grace uh, may not be always but it can be done and this is what we should look for and it it would uh, entail you know having background and having learnt and following certain principles so that's that's the background uh, what does it do so we are essentially an advisory company and we may also after advisory uh, we may do the crucial bits or the crucial 20% let's say uh, for uh, all you know our clients uh, so not just telling but we may also show how to get things done uh, by actually implementing right? uh, we that is at one level uh, another thing is uh, we might provide technical tools i'm using this word technical tools very generally uh, or technologies uh, to implement business strategy or even shape it sometimes i mean that doesn't happen all that often but what happens sometimes with companies is they're not aware that something is possible technically yeah they're not aware of a certain solution um so you know we may suggest it and it could shape business strategy anyway that's that's taking it to very clarified levels uh, <laughs> so that that's what so you do. so you evangelize as well that's what you're saying oh well uh, <laughs> I don't think we actually consciously evangelize because sometimes we see the opportunities but uh, yeah it's a good it's a good point we never I never thought of it that way uh, so maybe something to learn from you yeah so great so tell me i mean what kind of business problems uh, does swan speed actually try to solve broadly there are two different uh, what do you call uh, types of uh, areas that we look at uh, very broadly it could be software product development companies on one side and the other could be you know other businesses it could be we'll be speaking about it i, I expect uh, it could be a retail or uh, maybe some form of uh, what do you call it, travel or shipment companies or whatever these companies uh, so they they have different uh, kinds of things we do for them for the product development software product development companies uh, we help them with the M- implementing the mvp and beyond especially if they are uh, having to do things that are not not commonly done right not uh, what we call non trivial problems so in that case uh, we help them with that again it's it's, like, it's a bit like that advisory i was speaking about and the yeah crucial bits right we help them with that what we have seen is sometimes companies they have a good idea maybe in in terms of business maybe strategy we not sure but when they try to implement it there are crucial bits that almost no one in the team is aware of that they need to uh, address or they don't have the capability to do it for whatever reason uh, in, in you know it's like they don't know that they see 
give me an uh, example of this for example uh, there are some kind of data mining activities that are better done through a different kind of database rather than the relational database that people are familiar with uh, these different databases uh, systems are sometimes called nosql but nosql is not a good type because it, it uh, there are many types of nosql but if the data structures are not in form of rows and columns and tables which is the rdbms strength then uh, if it is not in that way then and you using it then you, you are going to run in a lot of tears uh, so if, sometimes they don't know so, so i mean anyway th this doesn't happen so often these days but it still does you'll be surprised it's still uh, people use the wrong tools for the wrong problem so in that case you you can't uh, so uh, if if uh, you know you have spoken about quite a few things that you do right you spoke about uh, the fact that you do some advisory consultative work you do work around product development you do work around uh, analytics you do work around uh, predictive and so on so what would you count as your strengths you know i mean as a company swan speed what are the things that you are really good at what are your superpowers Uh, again i think i will answer it in two different ways one is technically uh, we would be good at what we call a server side non trivial server side problem so we don't develop apps as such uh, we have partners who may help so one but that's not our strength to develop an app so if you see any app whether it is uh, something like uh, i don't know swiggy or uh, or uber or any of these of course there's an app part but there's a lot happening behind the scenes on the server side and so on right so that those are the kind of problems we deal with and it need not be the web 2.0 kind of companies it could be something completely different right it could be a business to business application uh, where we help right? so but we are on the server side uh, that is one one thing the other thing in terms in terms of strengths again uh, we mostly work on linux or unix like systems Uh, heavyweight systems in the server side, uh, but we also are pretty good in terms of how to handle data. Even even though we don't do it ourselves, so we're not a service provider that way. But we would know what tools where, what approaches to use where, and there in the predictive uh, analytics broadly and uh, forecasting and like like you mentioned. uh quantitative uh, anomaly detection these would be our strengths actually got it and then so, we also uh, do something even yeah. more esoteric sometimes which is yeah like um, i don't know if you are aware of uh, what is called as uh, real time systems so again real time is something that a lot of people just throw the word around but it has a very particular technical meaning so for real time systems uh, one of our partners not myself but one of our partners anand he has worked on it uh, for example he was part of a very small core team that built an engine control unit for one of the toyota vehicles so that's very oh, right. specialized so that's sort of thing we do wonderful very interesting so you spoke about uh, you know the topic of forecasting and predictive analysis which is what i called esoteric because it's not very well understood nor is it very well implemented in many companies across the world so uh, could you name a few good use cases you know for forecasting and predictive analysis okay <laughs> okay so first uh, i think before i even go to that i think i'll have to say something about uh, predictive analytics and forecasting now these are used a little bit interchangeably uh, but yeah. for someone who's a little bit of an insider right uh, it is not the case so predictive analytics first of all predictive analytics is in a form some kind of correlation and it can be about the past even it doesn't have to be about the future okay okay uh well, an example would be uh recommender systems like whether it's amazon or flipkart but the guy has gone and clicked on something now obviously he is looking at the details of it the system has to choose what out of its million different product types it is going to display along with it right yeah so the recommender systems are there and then you know they use a lot of data of a lot of past actions of various customers to decide what are the three things or seven things they show yeah 
that is so there is no timing attached to it so that's an example of predictive analytics when you come to forecasting it is always timed you can't just say because this is there that will happen you have to say how much and when so it is timed and quantitative so that's forecasting it may sound a tougher problem uh, sometimes it is but it is not necessarily tough uh, just because these constraints are there uh, so that uh, so the, these are two different things actually predictive analytics is a wide big ocean uh, but we have done some work in it uh, forecasting is you can think of it as a specialization within or you can just treat it as a, another ocean uh, so they are different things so <laughs> the long answer but anyway coming to uh, your the uh, uh, question use on cases. terms of use cases right yeah um so i'll just go with a few common ones uh, for example any of these cab uh, ca- taxi aggregators right uber ola they are using a lot of past data and so does google maps they use a lot of past data to make uh, predictions about travel times travel time predictions are, is predictive analytics it's not forecasting but if they are planning to uh, cater to the load of vehicles in some way i don't know if they do it that would be forecasting are they going to be more demand of customers in the morning or evening i think they do because uber does right so then that would be forecasting so they so that is one thing and another interesting thing is uh, flight timings as well as price uh it sounds i have said this in the same sentence but they are very different things uh pricing of tickets uh there was a there was a company called fair cost this is long ago so if you want to travel let's say from uh, delhi to bangalore and you are booking uh, for like a month later and you see the price you can actually go to faircast not not anymore microsoft took it over and killed it but they have also replaced it by something else wing travel so that's fair uh, so so you can look at the price and if you're uh, you you're feeling a bit dissatisfied faircast will tell you that maybe in the next not in the next 3 days but after 3 days the price is likely to drop because price this of airline tickets are not just you know the later you buy it it doesn't mean it will necessarily become expensive they can actually go down in between so faircast provides that so that's a kind of a predictive analysis whereas flight timing is different it's very specialized in the sense that it is not for us people like us it has to be used by air traffic control in busy airports in busy airports then you know even little even a 3 minute delay of a flight coming into their uh, control sector means the schedule changes Got so it. that's Got a very different kind of application then another thing could be adaptive learning so adaptive learning is an uh, is an application education tech and strangely uh, there's a comp- in india and i think even more or less in many places i've seen i'm not an expert uh, there's a company called mind sparks it's out of india which which does implement adaptive learning to an extent and uh, strangely by use has never done this so adaptive learning is you know you teach uh, so you give your uh, content and lecture or whatever it is on the system and then you take the student through a very carefully uh, you know scheduled series of mini questions and mini tests you know what the system does is as long as this quest- the student is answering them at a good pace it just keeps slowly giving more of the questions with maybe slightly higher difficulty level before moving on to the next but if the person makes a mistake based on data and other factors data maybe other students what they have done in the past it could also be the instructors input in some form ahead of time and then it gives a feedback and then it gives some other question or maybe makes gives a simpler question so all this happens automatically so adaptive learning systems uh, you know in a way they are also recommender system so that's very that's interesting all. very interesting now given all the different use cases that you gave you spoke about uh, you know like the e-commerce applications which make recommendations of uh, what else you could buy who else has bought something like this or the example you just gave of adaptive learning which is again something it's like the holy grail of learning right that if somebody is 
good learning well you adapt the learning pace and uh, if they are not then you adapt the content and the questions that being posed so yes. this is very very fascinating uh but given the kind of <clears throat> expertise that exists and given the uh, variety of use cases that this technology could be used for uh why is it that you know forecasting is not used as widely as it should be you know i've been a sales person all my life sure. and i've seen that forecasting is is it's practically you know it's it's not a science i mean at least most people don't see it as a science they see it as an art you know so uh-huh. but if if there's a good tool to help you it should be a science so you want to just explain why is it not oh. so widely used so oh, some time ago i was ch- chatting to someone one of my sort of friend slash acquaintances on linkedin and i i just said you know so forecasting is what i'm working on this is some time ago and he he came back to me like half seriously saying that oh but that's just guessing you you're just guessing the answer and uh, hmm. uh, not not something uh, <laughs> that i immediately liked but there is some truth in what he says Uh, in fact so then i wrote back i mean i just chat, chatted back saying well you're half right and then he came back saying that oh then he started thinking more and then said which half now that's the question i'll try to answer which half is it because there is some truth to it and you know there is this old saying about advertising that half the money in advertising is wasted uh, we just don't know which half I, I don't know if it still holds true. Yes, yes, it still holds true. Very yeah, good. yeah. So we don't know which half. So yeah, it holds so, true in digital marketing as well. So yes, as well. Absolutely. Okay, okay. So, uh, so uh, now coming to this, right? So there is some art to it, absolutely, and that art comes from people who are very good in the domain side. However, they, you know, because so there are two problems that they face in terms of. Uh, you have to think in terms of accuracy so as part of their art uh, they may be having a certain level of accuracy but if you add the science i don't mean replace if you add the science maybe the accuracy will be much higher so sometimes uh, in fact people are bad forecasters but they don't realize it because and this is this is something that's very common in india people keep making a lot of predictions and forecast but they don't note it down to see how much of how much of that is actually turned out to be true so uh, if they do it there'll be very, it'll be very <laughs> a very humbling experience actually so uh, anyway so because you need to make a forecast people do it and because usually if you know the domain well it is not a very bad forecast typically got it. Got so they feel comfortable with it. so what are the challenges that are typically faced you know by organizations in using this forecasting or predictive analysis what challenges do they typically see you know when they try to embark on such an initiative if if the company actually embarks on this um, on this and you know endeavor then first of all it's a question of having some awareness and depth knowledge of what needs to be done so one of the first basic things to many companies are not aware of is that they need to benchmark they need to because even before this tool comes in they are making plans they already whether consciously or semi consciously whatever they are making some forecasts in their heads or somewhere right yeah, because it, the company is operating so they do something uh, so they need to benchmark that and see whether this tool or the solution we provide is improving that forecast the accuracy of the forecast is better or not so that's one thing and many people don't know about it so and i've seen this usually on the software side companies people who run e-commerce and so on they just throw some data at some library which gives them some answer and they just go with it without knowing whether it's a good answer or not so the system just says and they just go by blind faith on the other hand if it is a company let's say a steel rolling mill Uh, whatever the answer is given they'll never believe it and they'll think that i know better so it's it's different right so th- yeah. that is there uh then the other thing is often once you get you have the data uh, so first of all usually in forecasting data is not such a challenge because it is not usually such a challenge because people have some records and you just basically need a string of numbers i mean at the at a simple level very basic level yeah yeah so and usually people have something so 
a lack of data is not usually a problem would more data help possibly mostly but with some basic data you can do these so that's why we are there yeah, yeah that's what we are yeah. uh, the other very tricky thing is uncovering what is called as unconscious bias uh, what is this unconscious bias because people have biases including the business including myself because i'm also choosing models right i'm also making some decisions while fine tuning so yeah. that may be there so i have to remind myself that you know i have to look at the results and just really go by the results uh, so that's that is a challenge it's not just with the clients it's also for me and then uh, another thing that makes forecasts really good uh, if you can find what could be leading indicators uncovering leading indicators is a challenge because uncovering those leading indicators is possible if you know the domain well yeah that's very important because if, if you, you don't know the domain uh, you won't yeah. know what is contributing what is the, to that forecast correct what is the leading indicator no you have to know in advance right not in hindsight so yes yes so that's the problem right uh, and sometimes there is dissatisfaction with the results of the forecast uh, but that is uh, uh, you know that can happen sometimes because people sometimes also believe that these people are coming and they're using all these sophisticated models and it's like a magic wand and we'll get perfect forecast right. well <laughs> that may not happen either yeah so what i have seen uh, generally is uh, forecasting tools uh, you know they they work as well as the quality of data that's going in obviously that is one important consideration and second is the you know robustness of the model that has been designed to you know based on the data that's available and yes uh, forecasting uh, tools do give errors but over a period of time the the response starts improving and you know as the model gets better that's what that's what i've heard and that's what i've seen uh, but uh-huh. tell me about what specifically these challenges that you just addressed you know that you just spoke about uh, how does swan speed put addressing some of these challenges uh, keeping the attitudinal challenges aside because that's through education and so on and i don't know if we can do it just on ours Own, mm-hmm. but keeping that aside so how, some of the things that we do is we run uh, pilots because uh, unless sometimes clients know they have a very well defined problem they also know that forecasting is a solution uh, they are more mature uh, some clients we have met and potential clients we met are more mature in that case it's not so much but uh, we you know if they are not very familiar with this whole thing and we have to run a pilot and that's useful even for us because just to answer you know uh, a question you haven't asked but in the earlier <laughs> bit you talked about uh, models you know can be robust and things will get better yeah uh, on the whole yes but not always because yes. there's something called forecastability Uh, i'll give you a very uh, different example right suppose you stand on a road and you have to you're supposed to somehow now you know uh forecast how many vehicles will be passing through that point every minute now if it's a uh, heavy uh, tra- uh, road with heavy traffic that's easy but if it's a traffic with very uh, sorry road with very light traffic some small village somewhere it's almost impossible to do it it's almost random yeah right uh, by random i mean uniform distribution so you we have no clue right uh, so if the forecastability is low it is you know you can so that is something that we have to also tell clients that your forecastability is low so you don't like please don't ex- expect high accuracy so that's that's one thing uh, otherwise uh, what what we can do is run pilots and we can also give them a realistic idea of what is expected and the other funny thing in forecasting is you can improve accuracy to to a certain level you can improve accuracy with uh, you know with our, with our expertise we can do it very quickly to a certain level but beyond that level it takes a lot of extra work to get that extra 4% improvement in accuracy it's yes. simply not worth it sometimes Yeah. One one example I can give you where people do a lot of fighting on this, and this is in banks, in big banks, and certainly central banks. They have a whole team of forecasters. I'm not in that area because they do multi-level risk management areas. in the risk management function. It could be risk management function, but it's also you know when I'm talking about RBI stuff like yeah. yeah, it is like foreign exchange rates, 
uh, it could be about gdp Commodities. growth yeah so many things you know when they try to make a uh, decision on to raise interest rates or not so they have a team of forecasters and they the kind of forecasting they do is not we don't compete there they are totally specialized in that kind of forecasting yeah uh, so there it's a different ball game in our case uh, we have simpler structures of data uh, so we are able to work with that got it so uh, i mean if if someone actually goes ahead and implements you know uh, these kind of tools and these kind of uh, you know forecasting and predicting constructs okay uh, what kind of business benefits uh, you know uh, can they expect and how could the ability to forecast and predict what's going to happen or you know how a customer is going to behave or you know what's going to happen with a particular machine or what are, what have you right whatever use cases we have mm. uh, how will this be a differentiator for them so one is the benefits and second how will it differentiate them in the market so i mean benefits do differentiate but anyway let's let me take the benefits first so yeah. if we the most of the kind of projects we have done and the kind of clients we have done we have worked with for forecasting have been around somewhere around uh, supply chain or retail a uh, little bit on the energy side not so much but we we want to do more on the energy um, energy markets forecasting which is a bit like the share markets forecasting uh, but there are clearer patterns because it's consumption right so it's, there are clearer patterns uh, there is not so much of public sentiment that can you know throw your focus off totally right? so so anyway so it could be reduction in things like inventory sla violations because simply because you provision for it uh, shipment cost uh, they could be in uh, they could be better availability of goods so you don't have stock outs uh, utilization of uh, simply because like if you have limited retail space right uh, and you know something is not going to sell too much uh, but you still want it on display so you have some balance uh, and that frees up some space you can put other types of uh, you know fast moving display uh, items right so utilization is better and uh, more <laughs> esoterically uh, you could use forecasting for may pricing also you know you have some capacity if you know the demand is going to be such and such you could yeah. use this information to price certain things or everything differently uh, so that is something you could do uh, you could also look at effect of promotional activities uh, and see Uh, is this really good or not so i mean you get some handle on uh, this advertising or promotional like it sometimes uh, yeah there will be errors but that's what so these are the kind of benefits there in terms of game changing i uh, see actually uh, it can happen uh, it can happen particularly in uh, energy markets or places where volatility volatility is very high in that case but if volatility is not very high you know things don't change so much so when you make a forecast if it's a off, if it's a little off and usually it will be a little off if it is error is not little but a little more that's a small percentage right maybe 10% it's usually not a huge uh, a completely different ball game uh, but it, when volatility is high and if you are able to forecast that volatility well in spite of that that can make a lot of difference in profitability for some companies so shrini one thought that just comes to my mind i mean when we are talking about all the benefits that uh, you know forecasting predictive can give and you know it can uh, improve the sales it can uh, you know save lives it can do so many things right i mean so many possible scenarios but uh, uh, for a moment right if forecasting if a company is basing their decisions their future you know their customer interactions on the models that are suggested by a predictive model or a forecasting model uh, what could possibly go wrong here and you know what are the mitigations that uh, one would uh, you know suggest to ensure that you know it doesn't go completely awry you know so any thoughts on that yeah yeah so first of all it's a very very good question it's a little difficult to answer because i have to give some background so i will uh, attack the forecasting one first so in terms of forecasting right any forecast you give will typically be wrong if you ask 
how many units will be sold next week i may say 253 but it will be 253 exactly only if the earth mercury and saturn are all in the line with the sun once in a then it will happen otherwise it may be 249 it can be 260 so there will be an error always okay yes. but even what i'm saying is very small error errors are bigger usually in the range of 10 to 15 percent errors are there even with good models very good models. okay so that error will be there so usually uh, there will be some leeway it is not cut to cut so that's one thing in forecasting so there will be some risk uh, but it is not it can be managed by inventories and things like that so that's not an issue where it could be a problem is if the volatility is very high so volatility is very high so i forecast that there will be a spike tomorrow but there's no spike tomorrow but it's there 3 days later yeah and uh, whatever you have to do it has got only you know you have to make an arrangement on a day to day basis you're gone right you will uh, you will waste things tomorrow and you will not have enough 3 days later so so yes if volatility is very high so one day it's 253 next day it is 740 the third day it is 12 Uh, then we have a very difficult also forecastability is low okay then we should not be just giving this model to the client but the client needs a solution so we it say this is the best but don't hold us responsible that's okay but on the predictive side there's a very interesting case because one of our sort of partners they have a footfall counter they have a product called indry and they have a footfall counter Uh, and some of their clients, so it's about retail places where they look at camera data and count how many people are there and so on. Some of the customers have asked them. We are also interested in knowing if people are pilfering goods from our uh, shops and outlets. Now this is very risky because if the camera detects, it's all automated, right? And it makes a mistake. It thinks it's that the chap is pilfering, but he actually is not, or he somehow. Pull the cord and then put it away because he has lost his nerve or whatever, and you try to catch him and there's a big reputation on him. So there, yeah, it can be very problematic. The founder of this company, uh, Santest, he is uh, very wary of <laughs> going ahead with that kind of solution. So that can happen. Very interesting. And uh, one one more thought just comes to my mind that when you said that you know in a forecast there could be like you know five, ten, or maybe even fifteen percent variation, right, in what you give as a forecasting model. Now, uh, forecasts often compete with intuition, you know. Yes. yes. Uh, and especially like you gave the example of a steel mill, right? I mean, yeah. traditional manufacturing yeah. kind of companies where there are white-haired gentlemen like yeah. us. Uh, you know who have twenty uh, years of experience of how things happen, right? Yeah, yeah. And they have an intuitive forecast of what's going to happen. Correct. Uh, and we, when we come with a tool, we are competing with that, right? So if there's a ten, fifteen percent variation in the forecast and the actual, uh, you know, incident, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. then you know the people with intuition would say, hey, there's a problem here, you know, because mm-hmm. we're not. you're not really adding much value i would have forecasted this anyways how do you compete with that oh yeah so so there are two things one is you might have forecast anyway but so the studies have been done these studies yeah. have already been done uh, so i am a member of something called international institute of forecasters uh, so there these studies have been done and what has shown is that where they have this kind of intuition while they have a tool where they override the tool if they override the tool by a you know fine tuning by a small percentage it has been shown comprehensively that their overriding in is worse however when they override in a big way because they have some other information because the tools are usually working on limited streams of information if they so if i'm making a correction of 12% here there usually i make things a bit worse it's not dramatically worse it's a bit worse but uh, when i am doing a big uh, update or uh, override then usually the person is better and the tool will be totally wrong a cyclone is coming something is happening tool doesn't know that so you know tomorrow the number of customers will come and sit outside your restaurant will be zero or something like that tool will say something like 78 <laughs> so yeah. you can just override it so that that's all right override it in a big way otherwise just go with the tool is advice 
any case studies you would like to share with uh, the audience about how uh, you know uh, predictive analytics actually change the game for some of your clients maybe without naming them if uh, you know okay so if you can share a few good case studies that would be very enlightening for the audience <laughs> thank you <laughs> but i think i'll come back to you by saying uh, uh, predictive analytics wise there was a hardware giant which was you know they had a lot of suppliers uh, and if we so you know they took a, because there were a lot of suppliers uh, even to buy from them quickly at a good price was very difficult because they would get the quotes at different times and they even if they did one round of negotiations uh, it would be time consuming to go back and forth so we it was a simple predictive model simple in the sense that we tried 2 3 and then something called random forest worked out Uh, so uh, we are not sure why it worked out, but it worked out. Uh, so, uh, so there, what happens is they could get uh, before the vendor could give them a quote, they could already get their quote range depending on some factors. Ready? Let's go. Okay. Uh, so they were already ready. So for mostly, they were most already ready for what kind of because uh, if vendor A gave you a price and you don't know what B and C are giving, uh, then what do you do? You can't. do you negotiate immediately or you wait for two days and then you you know that sort of thing but if you already have some sense then you uh, good sense then you can start right away so this company saved a lot of money. they were ba- i mean they're global company but this unit was in bangalore uh, so that is one that's predictive so it's not forecasting and forecasting wise there was a this this is through and through and by the way it came through uh, nxtd uh, it's a uk retail uh, pharmacy project was commissioned through the manufacturer actually not the pharmacy uh, and uh, it is a drug which is high value but low shelf life now this makes it tricky because and it's a it's a drug they have to have meet the slas and they have to keep it you know i mean if, if you just don't have it then you can't serve customers for this important thing. so uh, that's something that so that made a lot of difference wow that sounds very very exciting but uh, i think overall shrinivas uh, you know uh, this conversation was very good because it uh, it gave a lot of insights into you know the difference between uh, you know predictive forecasting <laughs> as you said a lot of people use these terms interchangeably uh, i think uh, the conversation was very enlightening and uh, threw light on you know a lot of use cases and what challenges come up in this and how these challenges are addressed by swan speed consulting and uh, we ended with the case study as well uh, so thank you very much uh, shrinivas for uh, all the inputs you gave uh, this was very useful thank you so much for your time not at all thank you very much it i enjoyed much talking to you so thank you very much hope this is useful for a lot of people here it will be i'm sure thank you thank you